And hi, everybody. I'm Jacob. Uh, so I'm, I'm with Altimetric uh, Collider. So we are um, hosting this uh, conversation today. Really excited to have Neil Kane with us. Um, Neil, will, will you wave to the people so they know which one's you? I'd, I'd point, but I don't think uh, everyone's right. sort of the same here. Woo. Uh, <laughs> so for me, I, most of my background comes from product-based uh, technology startups. And so I had kind of an interesting uh, thing happen earlier in my career where the first product I worked on was a consumer facing technology that really struggled to find product market fit and had a lot of pressure from outside investors to start growing uh, before we had product market fit. Uh, so I'd love to, to hear if Neil has any thoughts on that. Um, but then I, later in my career, I worked for another company that had really strong product market fit, but ran into operational challenges that made it difficult for us to sustain our growth. Uh, so the phone was ringing off the hook, but we weren't able to keep up, hmm. uh, which I just never thought that would happen uh, to me because of my previous experience before that. Right. Um, so I've kind of seen this this happen from a few different angles. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by product market fit. So I'm really excited. Which uh, problem would you rather have now that you've lived through both? Certainly, I would rather have the phone ringing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and figure out those operations challenges unquestionably. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, for me, I mean, I obviously learned a ton about the importance of striking product market fit and then, you know, being, being ready for, for that growth. Sure. Um, so sure. I'm going to go ahead and, and kick things off with a quick introduction here so that I can hand it over to the expert, uh, Mr. Neil Kane. Um, so essentially, uh, uh, I mentioned before, I'm with a company, Altimetric. Um, Ultimetric is a uh, global digital transformation company. Uh, so we essentially work with clients around the world, uh, mostly large corporate clients. Um, Ford is our largest client in Michigan, for example, uh, helping them stay ahead of the curve with technology change and source innovation from within, from within their organizations. Um, the project Collider that myself and, and Ryan, uh, who's on the call as well, I, we um, essentially are, it's a, um, a community building effort amongst the local software developer community in Detroit and Southeastern Michigan. Um, so really looking to uh, help folks connect and grow and, and thrive um, and really build up the software ecosystem. Um, so that's what we work on. We do have a physical space in downtown Detroit that normally we would be inviting you to come check out. Uh, but for now, we're, we're very uh, heads down focused on uh, providing awesome virtual programming to keep everybody engaged and, and uh, connected during this challenging time. Um, so Neil approached me. Uh, we've known each other for probably a little over a year now, actually. Um, right. I think we talked right when we were kicking off the, the Collider project. Um, approached me, letting me know that he was uh, soon to be publishing a new book about uh, product market fit and how to... Um, how to approach product market, you know, uh, finding product market fit more systematically and how to measure it and, and, uh, and, and capture the elusive, uh, this elusive concept. Um, and we were really, really excited once we started talking about it uh, to bring that to the community. So that's what we're here talking about. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop talking and go ahead and pass it off to Neil. Uh, so. Neil, if you could tell Thank us a little you. bit about yourself and what we're talking about today and take it away. Thank you very much. Well, I'll introduce myself um, and one of my co-authors who's on the call here from the slides in a moment. But before I do, I just want to thank Jacob and Ryan for giving us the opportunity to do this. The rest of you who are attending may not know this, but the book just came out two weeks ago today, I think. Um, and this is actually the very first time uh, in public anyway, uh, that at least I'm presenting this material. So whether you like it or not, you're all guinea pigs and I'm a maven for feedback. And so very much uh, would appreciate, you know, any comments, good, bad or otherwise, um, at least by the time I'm done. And if you want a copy of the slides either now to follow along or afterwards, um, I posted them on my profile on LinkedIn and the, uh, the link is over there in the chat box if any of you want to take advantage of that. I'm going to share my screen now. And this always seems to take me two stops, two hops there. Okay, there we go. So you should be seeing PowerPoint and I'm going to 
<clears throat> Go into theater mode here and <clears throat> we'll get underway. And let me manipulate these controls here. Uh, so again, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. The book that we wrote is called The Innovator Secret Formula. And, okay, just a minute. Something's misbehaving. There we go. Uh, and it wouldn't be right without reminding everybody that it's Mayo. And were we you know, meeting in person, no doubt there'd be margaritas and sangria flowing, <laughs> tacos as well. So I'm a little disappointed that we don't have that happening, um, but so be it. Uh, all right, sorry. This always happens on Zoom. There's so much stuff in my face. I'm just gonna get it out of the way and I'll let Jacob monitor the chat. If there's anything I need to respond to, just let me know. We're, we're on it, don't worry. All right, there we go. So that's me. Um, really all you need to know is that I'm your classic serial entrepreneur. It so happens that at the moment I teach at Michigan State in the entrepreneurship program. So I've kind of pivoted my career a little bit going from being a founder and somebody who's attempted to grow companies to actually teaching it. Um, but that's a little bit about my background, and I've done everything from consumer products to software to a lot of time spent commercializing innovations that come out of university research labs. Most of that I did around the Chicago area where I used to live, but I moved to Michigan about four years ago for my job at Michigan State. My co-authors, Chris Sorensen, um, is somebody that I've known for a long, long time. He lives in the Chicago area and Matt Burkini, who I'll let introduce himself in a moment, is also on the call. Matt's out in Silicon Valley. And uh, somehow the three of us with all these kind of crazy different backgrounds, the convergence was a lot of startup expertise. Uh, and we came together to try to codify some of these ideas which grew up rather informally uh, over a period of years as each of us together and separately have worked with startups both in the Midwest and Silicon Valley. Uh, Matt, is there anything you want to say uh, briefly to introduce yourself? Well, just uh, first of all, thank you everybody for being here and thank you, Neil, for inviting me to join. I appreciate it. And um, I guess I'll just say that um, Chris and I started working on this idea of quantitative product market fit when we were both entrepreneurs in residence at one of the Silicon Valley startup uh, accelerators. And we were mentoring um, different kinds of startups, mostly technology, but not all. And found that we really needed a way to break down product market fit into its component pieces and talk to people about what it was, how to think about it, and how to understand how it's created and destroyed is the kind of way I think of it. We're at a time right now when a lot of product market fit is being destroyed, um, but a lot is also being created. Um, so being able to think about, well, what parts of things, how does this break down into components uh, can be very helpful when you're trying to work out a product strategy in a disruptive time. And um, I'll also say that I'm currently um, the CEO of, a, of an educational kit company called Tinkering Labs um, that I founded with a friend of mine uh, about four years ago. And um, we use these ideas of product market fit and quantitative product market fit in the development of our products and I found it to be very, very useful. So I'm, I'm hoping that the ideas will be useful to others as well. Great, thank you very much. Glad to have you along. And I would be remiss if I didn't also point out the URL for our website, which is at the bottom of the slides. Um, we're hopeful that over time, we'll start to populate that website with a lot of rich content and hopefully a bunch of case studies or vignettes or blog posts about the application of some of these principles. Um, but we're, we're just getting underway. All right, again, this seems to always mis be misbehaving. There we go. <clears throat> this is what we're gonna talk about in sequence. I should say that there's an awful lot in the book and as I was pulling together the slides for this presentation, it occurred to me that if I tried to cover everything, it literally would be a three hour talk and I'd probably bore you to tears. Uh, and I'm really concerned about sounding too much like the college instructor that I am. So I've tried to make it a little bit more digestible, but just know that there's more that's in the book. And even though I can't necessarily monitor the chat box as I'm speaking, if any of you have any questions or whatever, just speak up, shout, gesticulate, do something to try to get my attention. And I'm more than happy to address questions as we go. So part one of the book talks about the three laws of disruption. And the first one 
um, is a little bit fanciful, but it's basically that disruption comes to us all. Whether you like it or not, no matter how entrenched you are in your company, no matter how uh, permanent you think that your market position is, um, sooner or later you're going to get disrupted, whether it's due to external forces like a pandemic, whether it's due to new technology entrance, competition, etc. Everybody's going to get it in the end. And, and for, for those of you who have built businesses, you know that staying um, static or, or you know, not moving and not growing is a recipe for failure eventually. So everybody's got to constantly be innovating and disrupting on the margins in order to just have a chance to stay ahead. This slide, and some of you have probably seen variants of this, it shows up in a lot of different forms, but what it basically conveys is the fact that over time, and particularly through you know, the latter half of the 20th century and now into the 21st, um, the world really is getting faster. And what this shows you is the amount of time that it took from the introduction of basic new technologies like say the telephone to reach a certain percentage of households. So if we look at the telephone here, which was introduced sometime before 1900, I think in 1900 there was maybe 5% of households had telephones. And you can see it took all the way until, you know, let's say about 1960, so well over 50 years to penetrate about 80% of the households. But if we look at something like a computer, okay, um, which was introduced in the late 70s, you know, in maybe 15 years, 20 years, you know, about 80% of households had PCs. Um, or I apologize, maybe, I'm not, I, I think the computer, uh, I apologize, the computer curve is this blue one, which is even faster. And in other versions of this, if you look at later things like cell phones, and then I think the, uh, and tablet computers, um, and then other things like Wi-Fi and so forth, it gets even steeper, right? So um, the world really is getting faster, even though that may sometimes, uh, you know, you may sometimes wonder whether that's all in your imagination. Well, it's not. The second law of disruption is that all disruption is caused by changes in product market fit. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining what product market fit is. If you take nothing away, nothing else away from this talk, but learn what that is, it will help you quite a bit. And then the third law of disruption is that there are only three ways to change product market fit. So our basic premise is that all disruption and disruptive innovations are caused by changes in product market fit. And there's basically only three ways to make that happen, which I'll go into in some detail in a couple minutes. But first, let me talk about what product market fit is. And this in itself could probably be a 20 minute lecture because there are myriad definitions and every successful entrepreneur in one way, one way shape or form has talked about it. Um, and product market fit is essentially a match between what customers want or what they expect or what they need or what pain you're solving for them or what problem they need to be solved or what job they need to have done. All of those are different ways that different authors have characterized customer needs and what a product provides. What problem does it solve? What pain does it alleviate? What need does it fill? What job do you help customers get done? It's that intersection, that fit, like two pieces of a puzzle between what customers want and need and what a product or service provides. And the better the fit, generally the higher the market share. That's our basic hypothesis, okay? So you really have to accept this and embrace it to follow along with, with the rest of what's in here. And apologies again, the computer seems to misbehave. All right, apologies there. Um, we often quote Mark Andreessen, who wrote a very seminal blog post um, close to 15 years ago now on his, on his uh, blog, where he said that product market fit is the only thing that matters. What else could it be? And he goes on in that blog post to talk about um, how you know when you have product market fit. And he describes other very important things to the ultimate success of a startup, like the quality of the management team, you know, the source of financing, timing, etc. But at the end of the day, unless, unless you find product market fit, you can do everything else right and you'll still fail. So his basic premise is product market fit is the only thing that matters. 
And so we quote Andreessen quite a lot. Now, before I go forward, I just wanna pause for a quick second and do a little bit of level setting about some terminology so that everybody's on the same page. So the first bullet, what I've talked about already, product market fit is the degree to which a product satisfies a strong market demand. Most people use the term very qualitatively, right? Like, hey, do we have product market fit or not? Or is our product market fit going up or improving? And what we've attempted to do in our book is to give you some techniques for thinking about how to quantify and compare the strength of your product market fit. A Couple of other terms that come up in strategic marketing and new product development all the time, lifetime value, okay, is the anticipated net profit attributed to the entire future relationship with the customer. If you have a business that's completely transactional, like a customer walks into your store, they buy something one time, you have no relationship with them and you never see them again, then the lifetime value of that customer may be limited to that transaction. But if, if you're a kind of business like Amazon or Netflix, for example, where you're selling subscriptions or you're accumulating and deepening a relationship with a customer over time, the lifetime value spans years, right? And so Netflix, for example, knows how much it costs for them to get you as a customer. And they have very good predictive models for saying, well, if you become a subscriber and you start paying $12 a month for their streaming service, they can anticipate how long you're gonna be a customer and therefore what the value to them is of having you as a customer. Customer acquisition cost is the cost of finding a customer. And so it's somewhat self-evident that the goal of all businesses is to have the lifetime value of a customer be a multiple of the cost of acquiring a customer. And a general rule of thumb is you want that to be three or larger. But essentially what it means is, is that in, if it costs you more to acquire a customer than the customer is worth, eventually you're gonna go out of business and no amount of scale, no amount of volume is gonna make up for that. So this is the fundamental equation that determines the viability, the long-term viability of a customer. Another thing that's often talked about is net promoter score, which is just a way to gauge the loyalty of a firm's customer relationships or using old terminology like customer satisfaction. Do customers really love you and are they recommending you to their friends and other people? All right, so let me come back to what we talk about in the book. So product market fit, again, um, is a way like the puzzle pieces come together and the products are like keys that unlock these different customer values in the model that we'll talk about. So things that you can see there like total cost of ownership, performance, quality, durability, prestige, those are all potentially values that customers uh, relate to or are willing to pay for. Um, and a product uh, may, you know, may or may not um, you know, have those particular attributes. Now, recognize that every single product is different in terms of the way um, product market fit is, is measured, right? So total cost of ownership could be a very important component for something like an automobile or maybe a computer or maybe enterprise software or something like that, but it's probably not gonna be relevant for like a t-shirt or a bar of soap, okay? So every product's different and I'll get into that in a few minutes. So the three components of product market fit are uh, the portfolio of value dimensions, which we'll talk about in a moment, the weight of each of those dimensions, and then how the product performs in each of those dimensions. And so remember I said a few minutes ago, um, all disruption is caused by changes in product market fit, and there's only three ways to change product market fit, and these are the three ways. You can change the value you're delivering, the importance of each, or you can change the characteristics of the product. All right, and now we're gonna go through these one at a time in detail. And again, please speak up if you've got questions or, or anything. Um, so customer value dimension is the first one. And you can see down there at the bottom in all of those different characteristics that have the blue bars next to them, performance, style, brand, utility, taste, sweetness, etc. Those are all what we call customer value dimensions. They're attributes of products that customers value to varying degrees. So in the case of a motorcycle, it might be performance, uh, might be style, it might be a brand. TCO, total cost of ownership, is there at the bottom. In the case of you know, a soft drink, it could be the taste, the amount of caffeine, the brand, you know, et cetera. 
And here are some just additional examples of customer value dimensions. Remember, every product is unique, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But it could be performance, emotional benefits, economic benefits, service benefits. You can, you can see all of them there on the slide, and there's many, many more. So the customer value dimensions define which benefits customers care about that influence their buying decision. Okay, so in the example that we're going to go through, let's assume that the first value dimension is quality, the second is durability, the third is price. This could apply to, you know, some sort of um, consumer durable, it could be a car, it could be a motorcycle, you know, something along those lines, all right? And the way we think about it in the book, and if any of you are uh, accountants or finance majors or statisticians, you're probably familiar with the idea of doing like a... Uh, you know, a weighted average, okay? So we talk about these customer dimensions, the quality, durability, and price, okay? And then we have to be able to ascribe some notion of how our customers or target market weight or what value or importance they put on these things. So for example, if we assume that quality is 50% of, you know, a customer's buying decision for this given product, durability 30% and price 20. So you can see there it adds up to 100, okay? Um, and these two things, the value dimensions, quality, durability, and price, and the weighting that we put on them, the 50, 30, 20, this is what we call the customer value model. Now, I'll have to admit that figuring this out for any particular product or for a new product may be a tall order. It may require market research, it may require doing what we call customer discovery in the lean startup model. It may require talking to people, you know, doing betas, um, you know, who knows, okay? So the model does assume that you have some intelligence or intuition about what factors matter to your customers, all right? Now, how well a product satisfies customers on each of those dimensions is what we call product performance. And the Innovator secret formula, which I'll slowly reveal, what we call quantitative PMF or quantitative product market fit, is the weighted sum of the performance times the weight. And here's how that plays out. So remember, you know, you can see there under the weights, we had 50, 30, 20. Now let's say that it were the case that for a given product, before I was talking about the needs and the expectations of the customers, now I'm talking about a particular product. Let's say, again, hypothetically, it was a motorcycle. Motorcycle, you know, that had a reputation for good quality. So um, this particular brand of motorcycle, you know, satisfied that quality dimension very, very well. It, you know, earned a score of 90. Um, it was a little less highly regarded for durability. And not surprisingly, it maybe was a high priced model because of the quality and durability. So price was rated a little bit lower. It certainly wasn't, you know, the cheapest product on the market. And then if you multiply those across, you take the weight times the score, you get this weighted number, uh, 45, 21, 8, you add those up, you get 74%. That's what we call QPMF or quantitative product market fit. Just as a side note, um, for a lot of products, there also may be minimum performance thresholds that if your product doesn't satisfy, no amount of performance in the other dimensions is ever going to matter. So for example, let's say that you had a product you know, that had excellent quality and the price was reasonable, but the durability was so poor that no, com no customer would ever buy it. Okay, so just know that if you're below a minimum threshold, then you're kind of out of the game, no matter how well you do on other things. You could imagine a product, you know, that's really stylish, but maybe known for being very unreliable. Okay, so it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Hey, Neil. Yes. I, so Nate here was wondering, do you find a general trend that are consistent between these types of traits, quality, durability, price? Um, well, there's an old saying that you can have, um, what is it, Matt, help me out, um, quality, uh, speed, or price, you know, pick two, right? Pick I mean, two. it's yeah. very difficult for any product to, say, have high quality, excellent durability, and be low price, 
that almost never happens, probably never happens. It shouldn't happen. If you had a product that had the best quality and was known for durability, you'd probably be foolish not to charge a premium for that. Okay, so, um, so the trend there, Nate, to answer your question is usually you get to choose two out of the three. If you wanna optimize for two of them, you're gonna to have to sacrifice the third one. If you want something to be very cheap, you're gonna to have to sacrifice quality or durability. That makes sense? And just to follow up on that, it, I, maybe this is a dumb question, but um, is, are you talking about like perceived quality? So like, like how does like pricing psychology play into this, for example, where like somebody might see the cheapest toothpaste and not want the, the, we're pr the cheapest one's not necessarily the best one, or not necessarily yeah, no. what consumers want. That is a great question. We talk about that a little bit in the book, and I'll invite Matt to chime in if he wants to. But yes, this is perception. Okay, I mean, perception is reality, right? I mean, if I choose, a, I think, did you use toothpaste as an example? Because I perceive it to be high quality. It doesn't matter whether it is or not. My attitude towards it is what determines my willingness to pay for it. Okay, and so branding, packaging, this is where key influencers, the celebrities that they wrap around a lot of products are all meant to create that perception of some, some barometer, whether it's coolness, hipness, greenness, right? You name it. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's perception is much more important. Now in the long run, I mean, there probably needs to be some connection between perception and reality. Otherwise, eventually you get found out and, you know, kind of called out on it. But I think that, can great, I just great. chime in with a thought? Sure, you know, please. Um, yeah. I think that's a really good question about, about price. And, and we do, as Neil said, we do get into a little bit in the book with, with luxury products in particular, where, you know, high price is part of the value in many cases. Um, it's, 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 you know, if, if, you're, if you're buying a luxury product and part of its value to you is the status that it conveys, like with a luxury automobile, for example, it's important that everyone knows that that thing was expensive, you know, um, and you want it to be expensive, you know, because part of what it's doing is, is showing that you can afford it. Um, that's part of the value that it provides to the customer. So yeah. the understanding what these things actually mean for your customer base that you're targeting and your product is really important. And, you know, we're using quality, durability, price as sort of some generic values that a lot of products have. But if your product is a TV show, you know, or a diet drink, um, you know, you're gonna have different, completely different value dimensions. And maybe the most valuable part of this whole process, I think for most entrepreneurs and, and, and product strategists is just that part of it. Thinking, okay, here's my customer base that I'm going for. Here's my product. What matters to them? What, what matters to those people about this kind of product? And then more than that, how much does it matter? What matters most? What matters less? What matters least of all? And how can I tune my product to be the thing that when they, when they see it on the shelf compared to alternatives or they're, they're flipping through whatever, you know, they're deciding what movie to watch, um, it's going to just leap out as the obvious best choice. Right. Um, and, and the customers usually won't even know why they think it's the best, you know, so you can't always just go ask them. You know, it's, it's sometimes these things are operating at a um, almost subconscious level, um, but that doesn't mean they're not there and that they're not really doing the work. Yeah. So. And, and at the risk of confusing the issue, um, there are many well-established products that have different value propositions for different market segments, even for the same product. So if you think about McDonald's, for example, there are some people who choose McDonald's because it's convenient. There are other people who choose it because it's cheap. McDonald's markets to senior citizens very differently than it markets to parents, okay, with kids. Um, even though ostensibly you walk into a McDonald's and there's really only one offering, right? So marketing is a complex topic for sure. Um, but let me go on. I think a, a lot of this will become much clearer as I go through some additional examples. And like before, my computer misbehaving. All right. So the diff. So so now. Um, so I've talked about this concept of quantitative product market fit (QPMF), and we introduce a new concept here called delta value, which is the difference 
in product market fit between two, uh, say, product choices. Okay, so here's where the entrepreneurship piece comes in. If you, you know, Nate, hypothetically, are thinking about designing a product, um, and you might be thinking about making some different trade-offs. You know, do we want to sacrifice quality a little bit in order to make it cheaper so that we can hit the price point that our market is expecting? Or do we want to invest in quality so that we kind of position it at the high end, but we're going to have to charge more for it? And durability has a similar trade-off with price, right? And so at the end of the day, again, going back to the example you saw before, right, where we did the, the weighted average and came up with the QPMF number here, you could now do that same thing um, across two different opportunities, two different choices, or, or a trade-off uh, of design choices that you might make about a product. And then you could compare the two and the difference between the two, what we call delta value, we claim is really responsible for product market fit, which then influences things like product, uh, uh, excuse me, market share. So the way you would calculate delta value again is exactly the same as I showed you before, but here's the two different choices. So see, for example, that um, the product in, in dark blue, okay, it does way, way better on features, okay, but worse on the other dimensions. And at the end of the day, it has a lower PMF, 79% versus the green one, which is 84%. So this shows you that a product that, say, sacrifices features, maybe it's simpler, right? Maybe it's less feature rich, it doesn't have as many bells and whistles, but it blows the socks off of the first product in terms of durability, while only charging a little bit more, has an overall higher PMF. Clearly, in a market that might value durability, this would be the winner. There might be other markets where you know, features matter more or price is associated with prestige. So again, all of this is interconnected, but here you can clearly see what the arithmetic looks like. It's very simple algebra. And at the bottom, we use, for those of you who took math, delta V for uh, change in value or delta value is the difference between the QPMF, quantitative product market fit for product two, which is 84%, minus QPMF for one, which is 79% which brings us to the innovator secret formula. Mm -hmm. Secret innovation formula, the title of the book is just this, that your delta value is the difference of the weighted averages of the product performance for each value dimension where you know, you're subtracting one from the other and multiplying it times the importance weight of that dimension. So that's it. Well, there's more. I got, I got a lot of examples to share with you. Uh, but now you know the innovator secret formula. And if I stopped here, at least you'd have an understanding of what we talk about in the book. A lot of the rest of the book and what I'll talk about now is how do you actually do this and, um, and some examples to show how this might play out in real life. So the implications are what's important. So QPMF, again, the quantitative product market fit, can be thought of as a magnetic force that attracts and, bind custom, and binds customers to the product. The bigger the PMF force, the stronger the attraction. So you can expect products with low PMF to have lower levels of loyalty, higher churn and lower lifetime value, what I talked about before, and higher customer acquisition costs. Conversely, products with high delta value should have higher loyalty, lower churn, higher LTV, and higher net promoter scores. All of those contribute in some way, shape, or form to market share. And here's, um, here's a graph which just sort of explains that, right? So you could imagine um, in the metaphor that we're using that PMF is like this uh, magnetic force. The stronger the magnetic force, um, or the higher the QPMF score, the stronger the magnetic force, and the more um, favorable the outcome. A low Q PMF score means a high risk of disruption and products with higher satisfaction are much harder to disrupt. Okay, so let me recap and then I'll get on to some examples. So QPMF describes how satisfied a market segment is with your product or service. It ranges from zero to 
The customer value model identifies the key value dimensions, price, durability, features, et cetera, of customer satisfaction and their importance weight. And then the performance shows the competitive advantages in which value dimensions represent the greatest potential for improving satisfaction. And delta V is the difference between comparing two things. So here we're talking not about an absolute number, but a relative number, the competitive advantage is the delta value, the difference between the quantitative measurement of two different choices. All right, I'm gonna pause for just a second. Does anybody have any questions? Are you hanging in there? Does it make sense? I got a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, just trying to wrap my head around what the main decisions this sort of work would drive. like. Is this supposed to drive like what kind of features I should be aiming for to include into my product? Like like an actual like feature set? Um, or like what, what am I supposed to get out of doing this? Um, and, and I guess when should I be doing yeah. it? Should I be doing it like super early on while I'm still thinking of ideas about what product to build? Or um, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering. That's, a, that's an awesome question and a great segue to what I'm about to talk about. I'm tempted to answer your question, Jesse, now, but what I'd rather do is say, ask it again in a few minutes sure. because I'm gonna answer the question or attempt to answer the question um, in the next part of the presentation here. And if I don't, we can come back to that, okay? Yep. So remember what we're saying is that all you know, profitability and, and the ability to protect yourself from disruption comes from product market fit. And there are five methods to improve product market fit. So here's kind of now, Jesse, the beginning of the answer to your question. There are three ways that you can change the characteristics of your product to affect product market fit through technology innovations, design innovations, or business model innovations. We'll talk about that in a moment. And there are two ways that you can alter the characteristics of the market. So you can change market attitudes or market segments. So I'll go into each of these in a moment, but this in short, Jesse, is the answer to your question. You could make different decisions about the characteristics of your product. You can make different decisions about how to market it, your business model, or you can make different decisions about you know, the market that you're pursuing. And I'll give you one fanciful example in a couple of minutes, but the book has a lot of other examples that expound upon these principles. And again, it's our hope over time that through um, the community that we want to build around this and what we'll do with the website that we'll begin to have a very rich library of case studies and examples. And I know Matt can share a few too uh, a little bit later. Um, okay, so technology innovation, the first one, um, should be pretty obvious to most people what that means, right? Technology innovation is a new platform based on a scientific principle you know, on which firms manufacture products to serve customer needs, blah, 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 kind of a dull textbook example. But a great um, example of uh, technology innovation would be lighting, okay? Once upon a time, we had candles, you know, and then Thomas Edison thankfully invented the incandescent bulb, which you basically cannot buy anymore. Seems impossible to comprehend to me, but um, for all intents and purposes, you cannot purchase an incandescent bulb any longer. CFLs are complex fluorescent bulbs were all the rage about 10, 15 years ago, and those are mostly obsolete as well now in favor of LEDs, which look like they're probably here to stay. And so not only you know, did these products get more efficient, you get better light, they last longer. I mean, on just about any dimension, except for radiation that you could think of, things have improved over time, okay? In music or recorded music, let's look at technology innovations too. When I was a kid, we had records, you know, analog recordings on vinyl or wax, LPs, right? And then tape came along and then compact discs about 30 years ago, um, and then MP3 players, which has gone through different generations, all right? And at each stage of the game, each new innovation for all, for most part, and I know this is a little bit of an exaggeration and there's always edge cases, but for the most part have completely obliterated the prior version. I know some people prefer vinyl records today for their sound quality, 
but magnetic tape is pretty much impossible to find. And uh, I don't even think you could buy a CD with music on it any longer if you wanted to. Okay, so this is exactly what disruption is about, caused by technology innovations, right? And when you have a real innovation that's rooted in scientific or technology principles, it also makes new business models possible, and it improves a product's performance in one or more of those value dimensions. Also, it may create new or additional or more valuable value dimensions, which changes the cost per unit of satisfaction. All right? And the book goes on to explain this in more detail. Is there a question? Let's see. Do you have examples of tech innovating yourself out of existence? Can you PMF too much? Um, I'll chime in just to try to make okay. it clear. Okay. So like the knife that uh, sharpens itself, so you sort of product market your fit. Sure. Product market fit yourself right out of existence. Well, maybe um, that's one possibility, or here's something I think about a lot because I was actually in this business. Let's say, for example, that you could make a drill bit that was guaranteed to last forever. If, you know, if I had a drill bit that I could sell you and I promised you that you would never need to buy another drill bit for the rest of your life, would, that, would you deem that to be good? Would you buy it? I probably would if it proven to be true well yeah. maybe so but 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 so so here's where things are not always obvious and why it's important to know your market i can understand that maybe you might if you know you were a consumer and you said to yourself hey if i buy this you know i'll never need to buy another one but you didn't ask me how much it cost okay so what if it cost 20 times as much okay or what we found out is that in a lot of businesses because of the way they charge back the cost of their tooling to their customers, they don't want products that last forever. They want products like drill bits that only last as long as the contract that they're working on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hospital supplies are sort of kind of think of them the same way, even though many of them are disposable for hygienic and sanitary reasons. So it's not always obvious that, you know, having something that lasts forever that is really high on durability. It's not always a feature or an attribute that's valued by every market segment. So you need to be really careful. I don't know if there's time, Neil, but I throw in one other example of this. That I think yep. I do cover briefly in the book. And I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the beginning of Netflix um, when you would sign up and you'd get you'd get um, the DVDs in the, in the mail. Um, they're, they were really good at that, you know, and they killed Blockbuster with that business, with the, the DVD delivery business, and they got very, very good at it. And they had this whole supply chain thing worked out, almost like Amazon today, you know, with deep relationships with the post office and, and, very, and a very detailed process to make sure you could go online and order your movie one day and you'd have it two days later. And so a lot of their value was based on this supply chain DVD delivery system that they had innovated and that they used to completely kill the entrenched competitor in, in DVD, you know, in video rental, which was Blockbuster at that time. But, you know, they realized to, to survive into the future, they were going to have to completely obliterate the thing that they, that made them successful and move into online delivery of, of videos, which of course, you know, has been incredible for them. Um, but it's right. an example of them having to innovate themselves, essentially making their own business their own core business obsolete right. as, they, as they migrated to a new business model. So that, it does happen. Yeah, that is a great example. Um, okay, let me, let me move forward here. The second way that you can change products is through design innovations. So whereas before we were talking about new technologies, here we're talking about using existing technologies in a new way. So maybe it's a louder guitar, a minivan that has more room, um, a social media network that connects people, or everybody is old enough to remember life before smartphones and life with smartphones. But Apple's genius in developing the iPhone was not by innovating new technologies. It was how they packaged and integrated and combined technologies to make something that had a superior 
value proposition for the market that they were going after. And Apple obviously is an exceptional example of a great company with respect to design. So design innovation is the second one. Sorry, again, it seems like every time I do something else on my computer, PowerPoint wants to slow down. Okay, there we go. And then the third uh, way is through innovating business models, like um, the Netflix example that, that Matt just gave us. Okay, changes to your channel, ecosystem, etc. cetera. Um, you know, a department store at one time was a very innovative way of doing retail because prior to that you had all of these, you know, different merchants that only sold like basically one thing, okay? Netflix is there, all of us appreciate and can almost see in real time how Amazon's innovations are playing out and, uh, and on and on and on. All right, remember there were five ways, now the other two ways were the market methods. So another way of doing this is to change customers' attitudes about the importance of a value dimension or a product's performance. I used to work for IBM and we used to have a joke there that you know, if you can't fix something, feature it, right? You take what, you, what might be perceived as a limitation of your product and you try to sell it as a characteristic or something that customers should value. Um, so we're gonna talk about Crisco for a moment and I just love this example, which is why I talk about it, um, even though it's clearly low tech, it's about the lowest tech product you could ever imagine. <laughs> Most of you may or may not, doesn't seem like it's as popular any longer as it was uh, decades ago, but Crisco is basically vegetable shortening, okay? It's something that you use to cook and bake with, right? And a little over 100 years ago, William Proctor and his brother-in-law, James Gamble, AKA Proctor and Gamble, were being disrupted out of the candle business. P&G started as a company that made candles and soap, okay? And they had a problem when the electric light bulb came along and that was not only was their candle business being disrupted, hard to sort of comprehend that notion, candle business being disrupted, but it was, but they also um, had a supply chain problem, okay? Because they had these cottonseed mills that were producing cottonseed oil for candles and soap and suddenly they had a huge oversupply. Um, and what they needed was a new product that they could make from cottonseed oil to take advantage of the supply that they had available to them. And what they discovered was that by adding hydrogen to liquid cottonseed oil, you could turn it into a solid that resembles lard. So if you've ever seen Crisco, it kind of, you know, from a distance sort of looks like whipped cream. It's kind of a buttery sort of a thing. If you rub it into your hands, eventually it warms up and gets liquefied and kind of looks like, you know, Wesson corn oil. Okay, um, but what they discovered was that by hydrogenating it, um, they could turn it into something that looked like lard, which was a very popular and widely used product at the time. Lard, which of course is made from animal fat, okay, was very well known and very well liked and has a, you know, wonderful taste profile like butter. Crisco was a completely unknown revolutionary synthetic product, and most people thought it tasted worse than lard, okay? So this is the predicament. And this story that I'm telling here encapsulates all of the principles that we've talked about before. So if you're Procter & Gamble, which today has a reputation for outstanding marketing for the reasons that'll become apparent in a moment, you say to yourself, you know, hey, we got a warehouse full of this Crisco stuff, what the hell do we do with it? How do we peddle it? How do we sell it? Okay, remember the model that we showed you before of those different value dimensions, okay? It's not any cheaper necessarily than lard. It's not, doesn't taste as good, okay? So what do you do if you wanna create a market for Crisco, okay? Here you can see those two value dimensions. Um, it has no brand name, even though lard is a generic term, everybody knows what lard is, whereas Crisco had no brand recognition at the time, and it couldn't compete on brand or taste. So if you're the quote unquote brand manager for Crisco, what's your move? Anybody have a guess? Elf? Who said that? Jacob. Very good. I don't know, did you read the book? 
<laughs> Not yet. Okay. Wait, I'm a copy. Hang on, as before, PowerPoint, just every time I click off a of PowerPoint and then try to get back to it. There we go. Health, yes. Okay, so they introduced a new dimension, health, which was really sort of an artificially made up one because there was no evidence whatsoever that Crisco was healthier than lard, but they claimed that it was, and then they had to build market awareness around the importance of health as a dimension that people, mostly housewives at the time, would value. And remember that model where we showed these different value dimensions, their importance weightings, and then how different products performed against each one of those. And so by increasing the importance of health over taste, they wound up sort of neutralizing the liability that they had on taste, and they created a new attribute health where they could really claim superiority over lard. And over time, you know, they wound up building a huge, huge brand. The epilogue of the story is that um, Crisco is not really healthier because hydrogenated, you know, oils, um, it was later learned, you know, were the source of trans fatty acids, which uh, a lot of people now think is a lot worse than animal fat. So it wasn't even necessarily more healthy, although I'm not claiming that P&G was acting out of bad faith at that time. They probably didn't know that. But many, many years later, that became the case. And now Crisco, which is still available as a product, I think they found a way to take the trans fatty acids out of there. Because today, now that it's known that trans fatty acids are bad for you, you can't sell any product, <laughs> barely, that has those in there. All right? So I think we're kind of getting to the end here. Let me summarize um, what we've talked about, and then we'll open it up for discussion or take questions or what have you. So three laws of disruption. Disruption comes to us all. All disruption is caused by changes in product market fit. And there's three modes and five methods to change product market fit. We talked about um, delta V you know, in that formula, which allows us to quantify product market fit. And then the three modes of, of PMF change related to product, product features, you could change the performance, you could change the importance, or you could add new dimensions. And then there's five methods, or excuse me, um, I apologize. There's something wrong with this slide. The, the numeration is wrong, I apologize. Um, but we talked about those five methods, the performance, the importance of the features, adding new dimensions, and then the product and market innovations. This is our book. Um, we've got a website up. It's a little bit thin right now, but if you want to keep tabs on what we're doing, you can visit the website. Of course, the book is available on Amazon right now. It's also um, available in a Kindle version. And it looks like this. I'll hold it up in a moment. And for those of you who want to contact me, I invite any comments, questions, critiques, criticisms, as I mentioned at the outset, this is the first time that we've really given this presentation. Um, and I'm sure um, some of the rough edges will be uh, polished off by the next time we do it. But I invite your comments. Any of you are welcome to follow up with me or connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you want a copy of these slides, you can find those on LinkedIn as well. And here's a copy of the book. So I thank Fantastic. you for your attention. Miraculously, we even managed to finish on time, but hopefully there will be some opportunity now for some, some questions or, uh, or discussion. Everyone could virtually give it up for, for Neil there. That was excellent. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I saw that intimidating or, you know, that, that fancy looking formula and I assumed that the math was going to be over my head. So uh, I'm, I'm just uh, happy that the, it's just basic arithmetic. That's awesome. Simple algebra. Yeah, it's really not complex. Love it. Um, cool. Does anybody have any questions for Neil? I think they were kind of flowing as we were going here, so. Yeah, no, no matter. But um, I, I can say personally, while, while folks are thinking about questions, that uh, I, I started out saying that I've worked on a few different products, and I can very confidently tell everybody that I wish that I had thought about this uh, type of framework or that I'd come across this type of framework, uh, you know, back then. Uh, so I'm really excited um, 
to, to share this with other people and also, you know, hopefully to, um, you know, uh, implement this in my, in my own future in entrepreneurial endeavors. Well, thank you. I mean, implementing it, of course, is the key to extracting value from it, but I'll make you an offer, Jacob. I guess this applies to everybody, but it sounds like, Jacob, you in particular have some very discrete examples that you can recall. Um, if you can think about how you could dissect what you now understand about how to think about product market fit to some of the decisions or the way you were you know, dealing with your products in your old company, especially the first example that you gave, I'd love to chat with you for 20 or 30 minutes and see if I can capture the spirit of that and maybe write it up as a blog post or a case study or something which just you know, illuminate some of what we're talking about here in the book. We're, we're very eager to find those examples. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, okay. We've got a question from uh, David Smith here. Uh, I, David, I assume you're asking Neil, not me, because I have not had a chance to read the book yet, but uh, he's wondering what your favorite part of the book is. Um, that's a good question, David. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you haven't read it yet. Um, so the book, kind of like the presentation, you know, goes through you know, the beginning half is a little bit of the, you know, kind of wonky in terms of talking about these principles and how we arrived at them. And by far the most engaging part of the book are these examples like Netflix and Apple. And we talk a lot about New Coke and how that uh, horrible decision was made, you know, by the people at Coca-Cola, Harley Davidson and their value proposition and, you know, how it is that, you know, their, uh, brand is so strong that, you know, people tattoo them, you know, people tattoo the logo on themselves. And of course, the Crisco one, which, which I quite enjoy. So uh, short answer to your question is I like the examples that illuminate, you know, these principles. And our vision is that over time, through our own experiences, as well as cataloging some other things, including many startups that I know that have gone through this, you know, we'll be able to start to you know, have a rich library of examples of the application of these principles. That's excellent. Um, and I do fully intend for this to be available at the uh, Collider library as soon as we're back <laughs> open. So okay. just so that everybody knows, you'll be able to come and peruse it at our office as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, if, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to, to um, post them in the chat here. But while we're doing that, um, I'm gonna just start wrapping up because we're beyond time. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank uh, Neil and, and uh, Matthew here for, for their amazing contributions and sharing all this awesome knowledge. Um, and also just to, to everybody for, for joining us here. This is, uh, this is really great to see folks coming out and uh, engaging like this. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're uh, very focused on providing um, lots of, of virtual programming to keep folks engaged and connected uh, during this challenging time. Um, so definitely, uh, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind plopping the uh, meetup link in the chat here, um, definitely connect with us if you haven't already um, on either meetup or social media. We have a great e-newsletter that goes out uh, roughly once a week, um, highlighting awesome tech news and events happening in Detroit. Uh, yeah. And we have a, just as an example, a product engineering uh, session next Wednesday that we'll have more information posted about very shortly. Um, and a lot of other really exciting content coming soon, uh, hopefully that program with Lee and some others. Um, so definitely connect with us and, and stay tuned because um, we have lots of uh, relevant content coming your way. Um, Jacob, I applaud what you guys are doing at Altametric. I mean, you've really assumed a leadership role in the community for doing this sort of stuff and convening people to talk about interesting topics. So I thank you for that and the opportunity to speak. Um, I know we're wrapping up, Matt. I want to give you the last word in case there's anything burning in your mind that you want to add to the discussion before we break. Well, no, I think that was great. I guess I would just encourage everyone to remember that, um, you know, there's two parts to product market fit. There's product and market, <laughs> and, uh, and they're, they're equally important. Um, and I think a lot of the undercurrent of the book is that that's really what it's about. You know, it's not about one thing. It's not just your product. It's your product and its relationship with one or more market segments and, and, and how they fit together. And I think the more you dig into that with your products, uh, the better, you, the better you'll understand um, how your product fits. And you'll also start to learn what you don't know. Um, you'll be like, you know, actually, I'm not sure what, whether my customers care more about this or that. And that gives you an important thing to go out and try to find out. 
So yeah. I hope people will, will um, take advantage of that and, and go out and try to do it with their own products and businesses. Wonderful. Very good. And, and note that uh, this presentation was recorded, so we'll follow up with the, uh, with the um, video link. Uh, if you did not register for the webinar, um, I would encourage you to connect with us. Um, if you want to subscribe to the email list or website or just some other way that we can, or just private message me your email address um, so that we can send that to you. Um, but yeah, that information will be available. And as Neil mentioned, the slides are on his uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, that I will repost right now. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, everybody. We'll hang around for another few minutes in case any questions pop up. And then uh, I hope everybody has a, a lovely evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Yes. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Well, Mar Mar it's margarita time now. <laughs>
And most investors won't fund you unless you have that kind of capability built into your product idea. Is that a perceived 10 times better or a quantitative 10 times better or a mixture? Uh, I think that's a semantic argument. I mean, perception is reality, but it really needs to be 10 times better. It needs to be the kind of thing where, you know, if I were a potential consumer, I might say, you know what, I've been, you know, I've had a landline for 40 years, but this thing is so awesome. I'm just going to buy this and, and get rid of my landmark. I mean, think, think of, you know, what was overcome for that to happen, right? In a hundred years of infrastructure. Yeah. Um, I think the but, way to think about that question of perceived versus actual is that, first of all, it's perceived and perceived is all that matters. But second, usually the easiest way to make something perceived to be better is to make it actually better. <laughs> now, what you're trying to do is get the perception, but usually the easiest way to do that is to actually make it better. So in some, in some real way, um, if, you can, if you can get them to believe that it's better without it actually being better, which is the case in the Crisco example, you know, uh, there really was no health benefit, it turned out, you know, um, then, you know, all power to you. But from, in most products, the way to get people to believe something is going to be to have it be true. Yeah. If you can even appreciate if you think about, you know, the Windows versus Macintosh debate, which has been going on for 40 years, some people just absolutely think Mac's better. They wouldn't want a Windows computer if it were free. And other people are just completely the opposite, right? No. Different strokes for different folks, right? Both, both, let you, both let you get your job done if your job is to do email and surf the web and do programming and stuff like that. Both are completely adequate. Also, Nate, just to reiterate that the, 10, the 10X that he's describing is, is VC backable businesses too. So yeah. that's not to suggest that another type of, you know, that if you're self-funding a business or something else that you might not, the 3X three, three might be plenty, you know? Well, uh, and, right, right, right. And Jacob, sorry to jump in on that, but you made a point way back at the beginning when you were talking about your company that tried to scale before it had achieved product market fit. Yeah. I actually want to modify one of the slides. VCs actually call that premature scaling. Mm. And if you read um, Mark Andreessen's blog post, the one that I referenced also at the beginning, what he talks about is he says, once you find your product market fit, that's when you pour gasoline on the fire. Yeah. That's the time when you can scale and accelerate things and money will matter towards your trajectory. If you yeah. throw money at a product that hasn't achieved product market fit, you might buy yourself a little bit of market share or some awareness, but you're basically throwing away dollars. Yeah, yeah and if anyone wants to talk with me later about uh, what that looks like in practice, <laughs> throwing money down the drain and ultimately running out of money, <laughs> come, come find me. So, and, and we're not alone in this, but there seems to be sort of a new cottage industry emerging on this question of there's universal recognition that product market fit is important. When you find it, you start to scale. But the question that everybody's dealing with eternally is how do you know when you're there? It's easy to look backwards and say, oh, that's when it happened. But in the moment, how do you know when you're there? Hmm. Not, a, not an easy question to answer. Super interesting. Great. Right, so Any other questions, guys? Well, Neil, I think your uh, your your kickoff presentation here was a, a rousing success. So thank you so much. This was excellent, and we really look forward to collaborating in the future.